Amoitasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Adu Sadu Sadu Hello everyone, welcome back. Tonight we are going to have an adventure. We are going to start what we all did on the We're going to look more deeply at the interrelationship, the connection between the meditation and mindfulness. And we're going to go into what this uh, meditation was all about. Uh, before I start, I want to talk about uh, a little, a little bit about what's happened with Buddhism and why you don't usually hear about it this way. Um, you know, it's been a long time. And that's like 2,600 years almost. And so over that time period, a lot of things can happen to such information as we got from the Buddha. And uh, one of the things that happens naturally, if I do meditation, I start thinking about this, I let it roll backwards and look. You can go back in time and see how this really happened this separation very natural very part of being a human being and the buddha is not here anymore and so now these monks are left and uh, all kinds of regular human dramas happen with someone wanting to be the leader and then someone wanting everyone to be vegetarian and then someone wanting to say this is what it was and that and we get to the first council and we have uh, Ananda who has this wonderful memory. And I knew people in the military. I knew, I knew people uh, when I was overseas during uh, Vietnam conflict, I met people who had this kind of mind. And they could stand in a room and listen to five people talking. And then afterwards, if you had recorded that discussion, you could ask them what was said and they would recite the exact conversation. So I was excited to see that Ananda had this kind of brain and he was doing this because I know that it's real and it is possible. Um, and then the preservation, we talked about the preservation before of the actual text and the preservation that occurred uh, was protected by the oral tradition. And what do I mean by that? The, um, the preservation was initially done with like, if you took the Majima Nikaya in Sri Lanka, there would be three major temples. Asgiri was one of the temples in Kandy and it controlled 50, was responsible for 50 of the 152 suttas in that book. Originally, there were 800 or 900 monks in that temple that came together every night and recited the suttas, parts, different ones, and kept doing it. So it was constantly being recited. If it was your turn to recite in front of the group, if you made one mistake, then it would be 799 other monks of the 800 who would say, stop, you have to change that and go back to the beginning again. And you couldn't go to bed until we had it done the right way. This is how it was preserved. So our modern idea of oral tradition being sloppy or not secure is it has no basis in Buddhism, all right? And of course, over time, there are other issues and political issues like there are today, where people wanted to inject 
suttas later in on into the text and there are we can't tell when it happened but we can certainly point to it's worth a look to see why you would consider one sutta in the middle of 152 for instance that has no other supporting suttas around the point it's trying to promote and the hindrances is a really good example we talked about that before so we have a cup one sutta that sits there it's number 20 and then if you look carefully at that sutta and you see how rough it is that people should struggle with the hindrances but then you go to 36 and when you go to 36 well a very interesting thing happens <laughs> you find out that 36 is talking about the same exact uh, words as the other sutta but in 36 the buddha is telling the monks now i'm going to tell you what happened to me with my practice and i'm going to show you what you should never do <laughs> and then he recited all the things they said you should do in 20 and he told them don't ever do that it's going to cause you problems and take a lot of time so this is fascinating discovery 20 and 36 in Majima Nikaya. You play with it. You tell me what happened. Because 20 is unsupported except for the first couple of paragraphs in the front of it in the beginning. But the, the heavy treatment, the really like destroy, annihilate, hurt, suppress, subdue stuff, and suffer while you're practicing to fight the hindrances, that's not supported anywhere in 151 suttas. So this is why I'm saying you have to really investigate and you have to not just investigate and not just listen to me. <laughs> you need to, we, I, I don't have a forest to send you out in, but in, when I was practicing, when we heard it that night and we sat in the morning, then we went out and worked all day in the forest. And you're, you're reflecting and you're remembering and you're working at the same time. And when you, um, something falls on your foot, uh, you're using the six R's. <laughs> and when the bee comes and you forgot to listen for the bees, uh, you're, while you're running, you're doing the six R's. <laughs> and so I don't have that place to send you to. But if you're in lockdown and you, you listen to the lesson, then the next day, think about, let it go run through your mind and start testing it. So we're gonna do some of that tonight with this lesson. So um, the point of talking about all the things that can happen, and one of the things was what I call the great separation. And all the, all the opinions of human beings, this is what he taught, this is what he meant, this and this and this. And we ended up not with the, uh, in the one split, there was uh, 18, 18 schools under the first, in the beginning. Then you had three major traditions and you still have today in the United States, probably 70 or 60 or 70. Back in 2006, when Bonte was the representative for the United States, I said to him, the Italian is in charge of 5,000 Buddhists in Italy. <laughs> and the, and the, I'm sorry, 15,000. And the, 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 the representative of Finland is in charge of 5,000 Buddhists in one set, in one school. And then, you know, the, the Asian schools, they're, they're talking about one country with one school, Mahayana, Theravada, Vajrayana. But in the United States, on the plane, going back, I said to him, do you realize I just did some research and there are 27 different school groups and they're not talking to each other. They're not working together. They're saying, I'm right, you're wrong, all this is happening. And that's, it's important everybody is really trying to be benevolent they are all trying to do good this is the good part 
I just wish sometimes <laughs> that we were further along in 2020. <laughs> I said to somebody earlier today in 1968, we all got together, you know, a lot was going on and we said everybody should be able to be fed and clothed and housed with medicine by 2000. In the world, we meant in the world. And when 2000 came along years later, I looked back on that and I knew perfectly well because I was working with political people and senators and congressmen and stuff doing human rights work. I knew it wasn't going to happen. Because why? Because of greed and because of naughty people in the world <laughs> who just want to be so big, but they don't understand. They can't take it with them. I, I don't understand any of it. So coming back, we have a fractionalization of Buddhism and what you have to get a handle on when it scares you when you're looking at a lot of information. I want you to remember two things. I want you to remember a bicycle. The first time you ever saw a bicycle and somebody was going to teach you when you were little all those parts of that bicycle and teach you how to ride it. And you listened very carefully and you didn't get the connection between the pedals and the brakes and the gears and steering and sitting and everything. But once you rode the bike, it started just all comes together and you knew it, all the parts were there. And if you stopped or fell off your bike or got a flat tire, you would know what to do. Now look at a car. How many things were you told about when you were taught to drive and take care of your car? You had to learn about the oil, and the gas, and the brake fluid, and the uh, you know transmission fluid, and you had to look for water for the windshield, and the, and then all this stuff, you had to know about that. Unless you're rich and you pay somebody to do it, you had to take care of it. But you didn't get the connection until you were driving. Well, you're meditating. So when I give you a lot of things. In, and I'm showing you, we need shorter lessons. I agree with you. And tonight it's shorter. This is a miracle. May and I made it shorter. <laughs> we just cut it in half. Okay. And we have an exercise at the end of it. So I'm going to dive into it. But Buddhism, all the pieces of it, what happened was the commentary, it's not just the main commentary. Don't get me wrong. This is all commentaries. They... I'm going to be the expert on this book or that book or that book, but not all of them that is the whole story. Uh, that's what was happening. And I'm right, and I want to project just one piece. That's not Buddhism. Buddhism is like uh, a weaving. The thing that comes to me most is I used to work on a loom, and this is a a tapestry that has all of the pieces that come together like this and then they work. So you take notes and you keep track and I'm trying to start to uh, bold out the things that you ought to be asking questions about if you don't understand. As I write these documents, I'm trying to bold them, whether they're words or phrases. Now we did, we started doing this. We didn't get very far in this one, but when I take all that we've done and go back through it, we need to bold these things and get you to question, question, question. How does that work? How does it hook into this piece? And you're going to discover when I show you tonight, how some of the dependent origination works, um, you know, how, how human cognition works. When I show you how, the benefit of the, of the meditation is you begin to know what's happening to you all the time. And if you do something silly like, oh, geez, so oh, what happened? Oh, my God. You, okay, it's finished. <laughs> That's in the past now. You don't get stuck carrying around the sad, distressed feeling or the anger or stuff like that. You let it go. You begin to understand you're in a little car. And you're going along this lifeline and you're just tooling along and you're always moving. Just remember that in your head. Whatever happens this morning, 
by the afternoon, it's behind you and you're still moving along in this little car. You see? I want you guys to think about these things. That makes it easier for you as you go along. Now, um, I was going to turn, I don't know where our deacon is. He probably went and hid <laughs> because he told me he was going to come tonight. And, uh, oh, is that our, there he is. Okay. Uh, we were going to turn the chat on. We were, we, okay. We were thinking about turning the chat on and letting it sit on the side. If you want to write questions on it, when you hear things, write a question. And then at the end, I'm going to have more time to talk to you. Okay. So we're going to do this like this, but we're going to put this. I don't know what it's telling me. What's it telling me? Oh. Can I, can I, I can pull it. So he was going to, he was going to kind of mind this, you know, he was going to uh, mind this just to see if there were uh, questions that were coming up because people told me that um, this is how they do it. When there's a lot of people in a room, uh, this is how they do it. You're supposed to take it in. <laughs> So funny. I can't move it down. Okay, it's going to sit there. Here we go. We're going to go on the share screen first. Now, I, I sent you some documents, and we're going to touch those documents as we, as we go along. Here's one we can get rid of. We always have so many we can get rid of. Whoops, what happened now? Oh, what did I do now? Okay. <laughs> I can't find, can't find my... Uh-oh, now I got rid of share screen. How did I do that? Oh, here, wait a minute. Okay. So I'm going to bring up the document. I am going to. Uh, no, no. <laughs> I was. One of these days I'll be an expert. Wouldn't that be amazing? How do you get this up? I can't get it onto the share screen. Can somebody tell me how to do it? Yeah. Um, um, Jimo, we can already see the document. So I think it's already up. The problem isn't you. The problem is me. I can't see it. How do I see it? Oh, okay. Maybe I just do it this way. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you hear me if I minimize? Is that okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Go back to Zoom. I'm, I'm in Zoom, but I can't get to my paper. Why? Ours is not to wonder why. Ours is just to 6R and not die. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, uh, maybe you do it a uh, full page or uh, something like that. Just double click on the zoom. Your screen sharing, your screen sharing is paused. Stop. Okay. Now screen share and do that. How do I make this big? There. Oh, it, why is it doing that? <laughs> told you, May, there's a little person inside this computer. <laughs> I can't find the document. Now we can see the document. I'm glad, but I can't. <laughs> I can't find it, so how do I do it? Oh boy, here you go. All right. Sorry, I just put you down there. Okay, <clears throat> now... Um, I don't know how this is going. I know, this is okay. Mm. Oh, this is so hard. Well, I don't think we're going to be able to um, uh, do this chat. I can't see the document. Okay, here we go. Your topic tonight is meditation and. Um, what is meditation and mindfulness? But what we're talking about is meditation and mindfulness as the two interwoven components of your meditation. For what reason 
so that when you meditate, you can witness dependent origination. Now, some of you are sitting there and saying, oh my gosh, she's going to tell us about dependent origination. It's so big. It's so hard. No, listen carefully. Dependent origination has three ways of looking at it. This is not on your document. Just listen. The first way is a macrocosmic way of looking at it, which is true and it's real. You will realize this someday in your meditation. You'll realize how he got to this conclusion, but it talks about from lifetime to lifetime, how we keep going through different lifetimes. It's not me. It is the energy of my karma and consciousness that is moving. Okay. And you get keep moving lifetime to lifetime because uh, this is happening where you might be a man, a woman, a man, a woman. You might be on a pink planet, a purple planet, and then a green planet. It could be anywhere that this is happening to you. And, um, but it isn't you, really. It's just a being. And as we behave, our energy comes from our karma and affects the... Uh, the universal consciousness and that goes into another being and then things happen in that person's life they don't even understand why it's happening and this is where we see weird things like me being afraid of heights at 51 years old when my whole life i could climb 30 foot trees this is silly but there was a reason for it anyway that's the macrocosmic view. The, the, the microcosmic view is the one where you look at your brain and somebody says, don't bother to ever look at dependent origination because if you do, you won't understand it because it's your brain and it's moving so fast that you cannot even see what, how many times the, the cycle happens between the time that the apple breaks off the tree and falls down to the ground. This is what Ajahn Chah said. So he just didn't talk about it. He didn't teach from the text directly about that. Because of that, it was in the chanting some, but it wasn't something he would encourage a monk to sit and listen to. And that's why. So I, we thought about this a lot. And the problem I had with it was that I couldn't uh, swallow the idea that the people themselves had not learned a lot about what the Buddha taught. It wasn't just the monks and nuns. It was the common person. I wanted to know what it was that the Buddha taught the common person, the farmer, and the uh, shopkeeper and the accountants, everybody in the stories, what did he teach them? And what he taught them, in my opinion, and, and Bhante agrees with this, that you, there was a middle way that he taught. And the question you ask about the middle way is interesting. Usually you hear that the middle way is just the Buddha was not an eternalist, meaning that you personally go on again and again and again. And he was not an annihilationist, something where you live one life and then it's all over and there's nothing left at all of anything, okay? He was neither one. He taught in the middle. Well, that's true. But let me ask you a question. If you start contemplating this, what if he taught the middle way in every piece of the Dhamma that he taught. When he taught the Eightfold Path, what if he was teaching uh, in, in the middle way of it, not just the general way, and then in a concentrated way, he was teaching, uh, he was teaching about uh, what happens in the meditation with the Eightfold Path and how it works. Then you have a whole different way of studying the dependent or, or the uh, or the four numbers, or faculties and powers and right effort and everything that's part of the 37 requisites, you get to look at it differently. So when I'm teaching you, understand that I'm sort of a, a, a fundamental Buddhist <laughs> that went back into the text and I tried to find 
What was it that was of value that would really make those people want to support these monks and protect the teaching as long as they possibly could help to keep it existing? What was it? That's what we're, we're hunting for. So I want you to think about something for a moment. What is Buddhist meditation really for? We're going to begin to talk about meditation and mindfulness and their relationship to each other. And just think, did you ever want, wonder what is supposed to happen as a result of practicing meditation? That's where this lesson came from. These were the questions Bhante gave in the beginning about this particular lesson. It's a perfectly reasonable question, isn't it? I mean, why should a person spend practice, spend time practicing meditation unless it results in something that's useful in daily life? It drove me crazy. There had to be something that made it in the golden age of Buddhism where everybody was doing something and I couldn't believe they were just sitting there. I couldn't believe it. So you might ask, um, you, you, um, you might ask, will I see and understand something that I don't normally learn about that will change my life? The answer is yes. And in the time of Buddha Gautama, meditation brought about more peaceful living for millions of people or hundreds of thousands, however many people were there. I'm not saying there were millions. Somebody came down on me about that point. <laughs> All right. Um, how did this happen? During training, in order to grow your knowledge, it's important that you ask questions and discover answers that you can easily comprehend. Their attitude in life, the people in the past became lighter and clearer than others who did not practice in the same way. But what set them free was waking up to universal laws that had been there all along and understanding how to use those universal laws. They uncovered really useful tools for living. They learned the true nature of everything and when old confusion was fell away, many fears in life disappeared. When you see the truth of life it, as it actually is, this is the key to living more easily in this existence. But how did it all happen? How did it happen? So the first part of this is looking at the, what is the connection between these two words. And we've actually taken, this is part of the separation that's happened. We put mindfulness out here and just sterilized it and said we can have a mindfulness movement in the whole world, but we're still not explaining what mindfulness was in the original context it was coming from Buddhism, okay? We're putting it more in the, in the same bowl as we put uh, concentration in the dictionary and it says concentrate very hard on something, be mindful not to move and look anywhere else. That's, that's the way these things were narrowed down and sterilized. But we're talking about what was originally happening. So we have what is Buddhist meditation? What is mindfulness? How does it the mindfulness support our meditation. What are we attempting to discover? And then we get into introducing de dependent originations in a new way, a way that has to do with one event in your life at a time. And you know, if you're trying to do something, I don't know if you've ever learned well, at sports or sailing boats or riding long distance on bicycles or any number of skilled things, when they want you to turn a wheel, for instance, and tool a piece of wood, they don't necessarily give you the complex pattern first. They first give you simple skill training practice. And you do it slow and then faster and then faster. And you start with one sandpaper and then another and another until you have a fine piece of furniture. You don't just go in there and pull a piece of wood and think you're going to make the table for the Grand Duke. It doesn't work that way. You probably make the first table like I did and it turned out to be the tool table in the garage. <laughs> That's how it works. But you have the principles of how to make a table, how to make a platform, you see? 
So Buddhist meditation originally is the practice of observing the movements of mind's attention in order to see clearly the true nature of how things actually work and gain a deep understanding of the Four Noble Truths, the dependent origination, and the three characteristics. We know the Four Noble Truths. We're going to hear about dependent origination. Most of you understand what the three characteristics are, anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Is there a shorter version of this? Well, uh, try this. Buddhist meditation is observing the movements of mind's attention in order to see and understand how things work and the true nature of everything. That's enough. Okay, what is the difference between seeing and understanding something? You know, you can see something suddenly. It just pops up. You can see it, but you can't fully understand it until you carefully observe it and practice using it. And the more you use it, incorporate it into what you're doing in life and how you are living, that's where you start to truly understand something. So the Buddha is saying, I realized something, but then he went in deeper. He found dependent origination, for instance, by thinking about it and reducing, you know, uh, deductive reasoning from death and birth caused death. Do you remember this? And then what caused birth was habitual tendency, the energy in the habitual tendency. So he was deducing it. He was making a theory, uh, well, a hypothesis as to what this, how this worked. But the thing is, when he saw it, this became a theory. And I have a lot of trouble dismissing this stuff as philosophy because too many of the elder monks have pointed out that philosophy is a lot of words and a lot of debates and very little application in life. And I don't believe that's not my Buddhism, okay? Um, it's like this. If I never saw a green onion and you want me to go to the garden and collect some, how do I do that if I've never seen a green onion? I don't know what to look for. Therefore, how can I bring the green onions to you from the garden? Someone has to show me a green onion first. It's a primary lesson. You see, is a story about the turtle and the fish and they made friends, but the fish wanted the turtle to come to lunch, the tortoise, and he was a land tortoise. He didn't understand what the water was. And then he invited the fish, why don't you come over here to lunch? And he says, come to lunch on the land. He didn't know what land was, the fish. So we have to get more information. Uh, in meditation, if the meditator is not taught the proper ingredients for meditation that, to work, then we just keep blindly sitting and sitting and sitting. And this is not what the Buddha did. He had a goal. He was investigating. He had a plan and a special kind of investigation practice to reach his goal. And there is information in the suttas that can help us to reach this goal. And if we answer some questions, it may make it easier to begin to meditate correctly. The first place we run into trouble with meditation is what is mindfulness. And we have a lot of blind-ended answers about it that make us still want one thing. We want to know what mindfulness is. So the mindfulness is the observation power. It's the observation power that we... Uh, must keep going in order for us to be able to witness the true nature of everything. But mindful also has a special memory component. What do I mean by that? It's a, it's a, it reminds us to keep our observation going all the time, for instance. How does it support the meditation is the question. Well, during our meditation, mindfulness is that part of your mind, the brain that is reminding you to do the six steps of right effort when it's needed each time. It reminds us to do all the steps correctly. It reminds us to be sure they're correct. 
And it reminds us not to leave any of them out so that we can purify and retrain our mind each time that we practice the six R cycle. Keep these words in mind, purify and retrain. You know, we won't get hung up when we keep sharp mindfulness present because it's encouraging us, it's supporting our going forward. Practicing right effort effectively purifies and it helps us create a new neural pathway in our brain to let go of unwholesome suffering instead of grabbing onto it like a hot coal and then it burns you. This is the person who didn't know you're supposed to use the scoop to pick up the coal and put it in the bucket. But if you pick up the coal when it falls out of the fireplace, you're going to burn your hand. So you need to follow the instructions. This goes back to the Alagadupa Masutta in 22. And um, the whole, all of the examples in that sutta, if we look them up and read them, I think they're in um, 60, Three, at 64 or something like that. All of them are written out. All of those similes are of the same lesson. When I give you instructions, I didn't do this for 20 years to give you instructions and then have you just try something else. When I give you instructions, I'm giving them to you because I know they work and there are some little tiny tweaky variations person to person but I'm giving you the instructions the Buddha gave to make something work. So you try to stick to the instructions very carefully, okay? Ongoing mindfulness outside of formal meditation helps us to focus on our tasks correctly. Whenever you are, use applied mindfulness and you are using your impersonal uh, perspective, everything starts to get easier. What is this impersonal perspective? I'm talking about, I'm really telling you what anatta is. The atta is the belief of an individual self that's controlling everything in your life. The anatta is, this is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. This is just what it is as it's happening, arising, happening, and disappearing. That's all. It's not mine, therefore I am not to blame either if something pops up and it's there in my mind and goes away. What are we attempting to discover here? You, you are attempting to see how everything in your experience in life works. And this was called by one Buddhist scholar, he's from Hong Kong, his name was Karunadasa, and uh, he was a professor, and he said, this is seeing the actuality. I kind of like that word. It's the, what is actually happening. Actually, you're happening in the here and now, and not in the past, and you're not in the future. You're right here and now. That is the actuality. What we keep saying, uh, the true nature of everything, what does that really mean? You will eventually apply your practice to whatever. And because of what you learn here, you will have an edge, meaning that you will have some inside information many people never learn. You're learning how to let go. You're learning how to notice when you're getting uptight and not that you're in stress, you're noticing how stress is beginning to come up and what's happening. You know, the place to look for that first is in the face. And the other place, the very first place you can see it if you're watching people in an airport and there's a husband and a wife and mom goes to change the baby's diaper and leaves dad with two little ones. And dad, they start running around <laughs> and the father gets up. If you watch the person, the first place is their hands. He gets uptight. <laughs> then you see the face. Oh, they're doing it again. They're running on the concourse. And then you see action happen. You're watching dependent origination. That's what you're watching. The steps in one event 
that you can watch happening and you can watch him catch the kids and how he makes a decision to resolve the situation or how he spanks them and everybody's having sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. In, but usually everything's nice on the concourse. So what you're learning is this helps people let go of fear, let go of sloth and torpor, which is the result of getting confused or doing something wrong. And afterwards you have this confusion of, I should should have done that. I call this the shoulda, coulda, woulda itis, the infection of the brain, where you start thinking, I should have done this, I could have done this, I would have done this. Oh, if only, you see? And restlessness and above all else, doubt because you can you understand what's happening. You relax more into life. There is an expression in the movies, uh, The Wizard of Oz. And in the movie, finally, the character Dorothy got to see the man behind the curtain. And suddenly she realized there was no wizard. Now I'm telling you this, the Wizard of Oz was the man who was in charge of everything and he was like a magic man who could make anything happen you wanted to have happen. But he was fake, okay? He wasn't a real wizard he was pretending to be. And this is just like that. There is no Nibbana I can give you in a box. It isn't here. You must do the work in your meditation and your comprehension to achieve the right condition for the cessation to actually happen. And somebody said, why do I have to comprehend anything to make cessation happen? You know why? Because if you're clear about how things work and your comprehension is very clear, your mind is available to rest and be open. And that's part of the requisite for the condition of cessation to arise. So if you don't understand how it's all happening, it's not going to happen. You have to get to a place where you have certain put things together and then it can happen, but it's understanding. There's no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. The meditator is trying to develop as you're practicing a non-judgmental observation skill so they can clearly see how suffering happens and gradually we're able to witness remarkable states that we experience that were just underneath what we thought was our state of life these jhanas they've always been there always been available to us since we were, were little but this is the beginning for you of stepping out of the conventional reality and into an ultimate reality. So those two terms, you hear them sometimes and the conventional reality is people with the untrained mind struggling through the, the feelings and the emotions and the strain and the stress. And the ultimate reality is once you know these things, the truth, the ultimate truth, well, then you're working with a different set of tools, okay? Um, we'll discover how consciousness cognizes. To cognize something is to understand it. The individual steps within life events that are happening day in and day out and we'll keep moving down the same life continuum line. But now we're going to begin to look deeper into how everything operates. And you start to see it, once I show it to you, the parts of the bike, when you start riding, you don't think about them anymore. You just keep going. You notice if this or that is working or not, but you just keep going. We notice the unique relationship uh, between the steps of the Four Noble Truth as you're doing your investigation into the cognition work. The human cognition is studied today. They're studying the same thing as dependent origination today. It's a funny thing too. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, 
it's nearly identical to what the Buddha found nearly 2,600 years ago. He called it dependent co-arising or dependent origination. Now the person, impersonal process should be learned first by meeting and understanding the individual links or the parts of each event as it's happening. The Buddha found 12 causal links. He calls them causal links uh, because, oh, let's see, okay. And he realized how none of the links have any part of the previous link in them. This takes a little bit of, um, of pondering, a little bit of thinking about here but that you, if you start looking at this, this is really true, that uh, none of those links had any part uh, of the previous one inside them. They depend on the existence of the previous one to come into being, but once they come into being, there's no part of the other one there. He examined this, Karuna Dasa, in a, in a treatise that he wrote at Hong Kong University. Um, these links have happened thousands of times a day during life events. And then through direct knowledge, this is where you see it directly, the meditator realizes these can be sensed and those links causing tension and tightness they can, they can be released by using the six R's in our practice for a perfect routine escape from daily life, from daily suffering. So you're in the office and somebody gets you really upset and you get angry and you, the conventional reality, that person would get, take it inside and hold on to it and carry it with them and be talking about it when they were driving home on the phone to someone else and when they get home. <laughs> Okay, but the, the trained mind is trying to practice being in the little car that's going along the life continuum line and continuing across and it realizes that you're moving, so leave it behind. Just leave it behind. At first, when you begin to look at this process, it is not clear because it's rather difficult to see. But this is a case where you must first learn what you are looking for before you can see it and let it go. Go back to the green onions. You learn and practice the names and the functions of each link in the process until you can sense the causal relationships. And when you begin to understand it and see it, this clearly, you are deeply glimpsing into the ultimate reality. Now you see the difference between the conventional and ultimate realities and the knowledges. So when a person is overcome so quickly by anger, you now know there are frames to edit within that event. And where a person is overcome by grief and totally incapacitated, you know that you can watch the cycle of arising grief allow it to run through without reacting, and then it'll pass away. And this might go on for a long time, but you don't have to get upset about it. It's nothing to get worried about. You can relax because you know what it is. This is so much, there's so much to learn with this knowledge and system. It's always a new awakening that happens in Buddhism. The more that you can let go of unessential thoughts, ideas, and assumptions, and opinions, and just watch what happens instead, okay, the easier it gets for you to see uh, the line of cognition in an event, okay? Now this here, I'm highlighting this part because when you, if you come into retreat with us, whenever you're in retreat, there's a set of, there are a set of verses we use in the Dhammapada and we don't change them. The reason is because, I know there are a lot of verses in the Dhammapada, but this is not about the Dhammapada. 
This is about modern man, and Bonte chose these verses, and before we die, <laughs> we would like to see hundreds of thousands of people who understand just this part. There are unessential thoughts and essential thoughts involved in every situation you go through in life. If you let go of the unessential thoughts, what does it mean? You, something is happening and all of a sudden you start thinking of what it's like and how it was like something that happened before and your mind is preoccupied with that and you really aren't here and it's happening now. What is essential is what is happening now in this one event. Then you can step back and calm your mind, decide what to do, then follow through and take action that is correct. The easier it gets for you to see the line of cognition in any event if you stay with the essential parts of it. You are learning by way of an experiential path, just as the Buddha did. That's what we're teaching you. The Buddha was a remarkable teacher. He kept reminding us of the importance of learning by way of knowledge and vision, which literally means knowing by seeing. And knowing by seeing is the same thing as direct knowledge. And the direct knowledge happens both in your meditation and in life. And seeing how this is direct knowledge when things come together and you start using them. Now, in order to see how daily life events trick us into states of frustration and emotion. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed this. What, what we're actually showing you is how one arising phenomenological, this is the biggest word I have, okay? <laughs> one arising phenomenological event can be observed and studied clearly. That's why we study dependent origination. So what is this word? It is, it's logical for us, if we want to understand the dependent origination process, to look at one phenomena arising at a time. And if we look at, we can, it's hard for us to see the fastness, the speed, of this phenomena is happening in the human being. But if we look at one event to learn how the dependent origination works first, then when we go into deeper meditation, we will be able to see the smaller parts. Um, we are never taught how things actually work. So when we teach you about this, it's like opening up a secret door in your house that you didn't know was there. In order to see how the life events trick us into states of frustration and emotional outbursts, we only, uh, we only need to be careful, carefully watching how seven of these 12 links in the process operate. Now the seven that we call the working chart, we're giving you two charts here. I'm going to give you the seven link charts, the one you fold it up, you put it in your pocket, you go through an experience, you sit down under a tree afterwards, and you say, what the heck happened? And then you pull this out, and you start reviewing what happened, and you see what happened. And this is what you can do with this. So we're talking about contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendency to react. These are your habitual tendencies from the past. How did you react with something that happened like this before? These are your personal recordings. You replay over and over if you have a habit of dealing with something that sounds the same, smells the same, touches the same, same color or same sound. And you always react the same way when that happens in your behavior. That's a reaction, an unreasonable reaction. Then the last part is the aging of the event and the usually the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair, it doesn't happen during the event so much as after the event or near the end. And the death of that event just simply means the 
that it's over. So we take this and we look at it. Let's go to one of our uh, documents now. Um, before we go any further, let's look and see. We'll just walk through briefly what the 12 links are so you can understand if I can just get right. <laughs> I can't seem to, I don't know, I just do it this way. Wow, how about that? <laughs> Whoop, wait a minute, up a little higher. Oh, maybe I have to leave you down, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I don't know where my, um, in my, uh, oh, I see. Here we go, back here. And we're gonna go to this one. Now I guess I got to make you go down again. Mm. This chart is the chart for the 12 links of dependent origination. What we're showing you is how to observe one phenomenological event at a time. This is a clear way to watch how mind works. Watching the links in the dependent origination within one event in life at a time is the most sensible way to attain a pure knowledge and vision of how suffering works. And the 12 link chart uh, gives clear, usable definitions for each one of the links. Easy to remember, that's how we tried to do it. Now, challenge yourself to watch seven links operate in one event in the next practice chart, but let's go over this one so we can see what it is. The first one is ignorance, and ignorance is pretty, it's pretty simple, really. It's not hard. The ignorance uh, simply means, it's the root word, in this word is ignore. And ignorance was referring to the fact that most human beings in the conventional reality are ignoring the process of the four noble truths. They're ignoring the dependent origination, which is human cognition. And they're ignoring the three characteristics of existence and they don't pay attention to what they, what they mean, so they don't have that knowledge. Formations, this is the potential or the preparation column for formations to arise. You just need to remember, this is the, remember this is the comfortable, quick definition that will help you understand. There's three kinds of formations. You have a bodily formation, you have a speech or verbal formation, and you have a mental formation. That's the three types of the formations. The consciousness is the vijnana, and this is the potential for the potential pool of consciousness, um, which then actively operates through the process of contact for each of the six sense doors or sense spaces, okay? And your sense spaces, we'll get to those in just a second. The Nama Rupa, the Buddha figured out, and this is a wonderful thing. He figured out if you calm the mind, you calm your body. And my doctor did not believe me. <laughs> and so he took my blood pressure and didn't like it. And I said, give me five minutes. And he said, for what? I said, I'll fix it. He left, gave me five minutes and came back in the room and took it again. And it went down about 10 or 15 degrees. How did I do that? Just by sitting and just simply relaxing uh, with, just relaxing with loving kindness to everyone in the office and compassion to myself and loving kindness to myself and just naturally breathing and just being quiet for five minutes and take the blood pressure and find that much different because my head just cooled down. See, that's what happens. Mentality, uh, materiality. It is the, um, the mental part of this is uh, the process of the six 
defense bases during the production of contact. You see, to make contact happen, you have to have a working sense door, like this ear is a working ear. And the ear hears sound. So I have the ear and I have the sound hitting the ear. And the mental process is ear consciousness. The three pieces together make ear contact happen, ear contact. What it is that says to me that this is a waterfall outside is perception. Perception jumps in there and says it perceives. And what does it perceive? It names the sound. It names the sight in the function of the um, sense doors. So the actual sense door, this ear, can be composed in the parts of the organs. It can be an element, the earth element, or it can be any number of elements involved in the construct of the auditory system. When you look at the eye, for instance, you have an earth element, but you have a water element and you have a heat element too. And um, it's fascinating how this works with the elements being involved in the actual ear. But the easiest way to remember is this is the material ear and it has a mental part that makes the ear work. Then salyatana, the salyatan, salyatana, okay, six sense bases. Five of them, just remember, five of them are your external experience. You see, hear, smell, taste, and touch with your eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body. And one of them is the internal sense door. Works with the thoughts that arise and is involved the mental part with the other five. Now you have uh, contact, basa, contact. How does contact happen? A working eye sees first only color and form. Then the eye consciousness arises. So the meeting of these three was eye contact. You can do this with the ear and sound and ear consciousness, ear contact. Nose, odor, nose consciousness, nose contact, and so forth. Feelings, easy to remember. Pleasant, when a feeling arises, it's pleasant. It's painful or it's neither painful nor pleasant. This is Vedana. Tanha, the craving. Craving always manifests as tension and tightness in the mind and in body. This is what I want you to memorize. It is like a chant. Craving always manifests as tension and tightness in mind and in body. It is revealing the I like it or the I don't like it mind. That's what this tension change is revealing, that you either like it, want it, and you're moving towards attachment, or I don't like it, I don't want it, and then I want to stop it. Okay. Upadana, clinging. When the craving occurs, it's just that one personal decision. You notice this where it's red on the chart. This is the danger zone. The green ones were impersonal and the yellow ones are impersonal and just potentials. But the personal links that are on the top, those four are the danger zone for suffering. Clinging is the story that runs in our mind about why I like it or I don't like it, whatever's arising. And this includes all of the thoughts, concepts, opinions, ideas, and imagination that pop up, okay? Bawa is habitual emotional tendencies. A personal library of habitual reactions which you repeat in life situations following the clinging link. When something's happening to you that 
he happened before this is where we go first before we have the birth of action birth of reaction for the untrained mind it's also where the birth of action happens for the trained mind this is where the birth of action three kinds of actions mental verbal or bodily or we can say physical action mental verbal physical and then the last part is the aging sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair and the death of the event this link indicated the aging of this event and then the suffering in the form of the aging of it and the sorrow, the lamentation, pain, grief, and despair as a result of this event and then the final death of the event. Now at the bottom of the chart, look and see why this is here. Mind plus a mind object. This is showing you how it, it works for a feeling to come up mind plus a mind object we're doing it with the mind and you're sitting there and a thought comes up and mind consciousness that equals contact contact as condition a painful feeling arises when the painful feeling arises let me do it that way painful feeling arises suddenly i don't like it happens that's where you see this craving, okay, is happening. And then you pull out your anger card because you always get upset about whatever this is, okay, whatever this thought is. And you give birth of your reaction and suffering happens. Now, if you pull, notice one thing on this chart I want you to know. Let's see the next chart. See, the next chart is bigger. This is the one you work with. This one's lined up better because you can see it only has contact and feeling comes up. When, con when feeling comes up, then craving happens and the craving moves very quickly into the clinging. Now, both craving and clinging have a grasping sensation or they have a pushing sensation you realize that equal strength i like it i don't like it and then the stories and everything that happened clinging is making the craving more powerful habitual tendency pulling out the story and then the birth of the reaction at the bottom of the chart emotions are not feelings this is critical to understand critical to understand a man came in to me once and he said sister I figured it out last night. I have the problem, the solution. And I said, what's your solution? And he said, I'm not going to feel anything anymore. <laughs> and I said, but you're human. And then he sort of went, well, <laughs> yeah. That's not where you cut it off. In your beginning of your practice, the place you cut it off is you try to see the craving and you try to 6R the craving, the arising tension and tightness that's happening with the feeling coming up. If you can do it, that's okay. You do it there, that's fine, okay. This is when you're looking at this one, up the step, this uh, picture, the big one is the emotions, they don't happen until after craving happens. You see feelings back, feeling is back there. And you see where craving in the, the front part of craving and, and clinging is where that emotion formulates. And they say, how do I know a difference between a feeling and an emotion? Oh, come on. All of the emotions have names, don't they? Happy, sad, distressed, frustrated, anxiety, depression, angry you see these are all the names of the emotions but the feeling was just a feeling heart and mind feeling the tone of it coming up is pleasant or painful or not neither one okay so this is all i'm going to give you on this but you play with this this week i want to ask you questions next time i want to um 
to ask you questions. Whoops, I need the, I need the, mm -hmm, right. Right, I need this back again. Mm -hmm. Okay. So back in the document, the Buddha gave his monks this kind of meditation. It offers a remarkable access to the fact that no individual has anything happening to them. That's a big statement. You should write this down and think about it this week. No matter what's going on. If you look closely, nothing is happening to you. Everything is happening from you. From you, not to you. That's a huge difference in life right there. What is true is that when present time events happen, everything is happening from you and you always have a choice what to do. That means you have a choice how to look at what is happening. This is your untold power. Mostly, it's unused in the human species. No one is the cause of your pain. No one is running this process in you. No one is making you suffer. Any formations arising are supported only by the energy from past actions and comma is affecting, that's coming in as an effect the energy of past karma, you're being challenged with things you don't even understand. Why are these things coming up in my life? They don't even have anything to do with me. Maybe it's from another lifetime. Maybe it's not in the past of this life. Maybe it's in another past from another lifetime from a man or a woman. Maybe it's a thousand years ago. Somebody did something and now things are happening or you have a fear come up you never had before, or you can't sleep, or you have bad dreams. These things don't always have to be your fault is the big thing here. You don't have to be a victim. Spend some time trying to see how it's happening. It gets interesting. Better than reading sometimes. <laughs> okay. How do we reduce suffering? By using the process of dependent origination. You learn your body operation well. It's have to be familiar with the body. This is part of what the four foundations of mindfulness is about. That structure in Satipatthana, that information is really, really important. And no, and you keep on practicing to witness how suffering works often. Just rem you have an event happen, you say, I can't see it, how can I watch it? Yeah, but after the event happens, if you review it according to the chart, you realize, oh, that's what happened. That's what happened. You notice the cause of its origination. You notice the cause of its disappearance. You pinpoint where to let go more effectively next time. This is how this is working. You start by looking at the operation of your own human body when our eyes are here, close your eyes and just listen. Just close your eyes and listen. Start by doing this. When our eyes are open, the eye sees forms. When the ears meet a sound, the ear hears sound. When the nose hits an odor, the nose smells the odor. When the tongue meets a flavor, the tongue tastes. When the body feels a tangible, body senses touch. And as a being, these five external sense doors operate in this way. There is no personal control of their operation. I do not make them operate. You do not make them operate. They operate when they are in good working order. Anybody tells me, but it's my sight, I see. Well then tomorrow when you wake up, I want you to call me. If you told your eye what to see before you opened it up. But that can't happen because the eye simply works. 
Now, internally, mind is a doorway as well to arising thoughts, and mind operates in the same impersonal way. You can prove this to yourself. While driving home, do you, you do not stop driving and decide to make a thought arise in your mind about remembering to buy the milk, do you? You were driving. The thought just comes up and it impersonally arises. So this is the first part of this lesson, the first part of it, and deeper understanding about how everything is working. We have to go a little further in now, but there is more, and gradually we take all of the sense doors and go step by step into how they operate. By experientially learning about these doors and testing them out, we're going to see that we are not responsible for their operation within ourselves as a human being. The meditator begins to realize this is true. There is an impersonal process going on here. And it's amazing when you start looking at it. So what I want you to do, this time I give you an assignment. Go to damasuka.org, the home site, or the center at home, and listen to the instructions for the met. Oh, let me tell you, I want to offer this to you. On Friday, when we start the retreat, we're going to do a Zoom class, and Bhante can Bhante Damagavesi can tell you what time that is. On Friday, we're going to do a Zoom class, and we're going to do listen to Bhante teach the instructions at the beginning of a retreat. Every retreat we give, we give the instructions very carefully for the metta meditation and the six R's. So we're going to listen to Bhante give it for our retreat that I'm teaching from Friday until the next Saturday. Uh, do you well, want to have it at 6.30 or uh, we can have it at 7? Because on your email you had mentioned 7. Oh, is seven o'clock okay? That's seven, seven. Yeah, some of my people are working. That's why I did that in the retreat. All right, while learning this meditation, please commit to sitting for half an hour each time you sit, no less. Try to sit a couple times a day for 30 minutes and you will start having progress. Don't be sitting 10 or 15 minutes or 20 minutes and think anything's going to happen. We've run tests on hundreds of people. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't work. So um, you read over the training information at the website if you want to and fo to follow the instructions exactly, or we can just bring to you um, the, um, I can send the, um, well, I think we have a set of instructions in Hindi, you know, at the twin site. So we should be able to follow from there. And of course, the meta instructions are in English at the home site. Okay. Um, now the exercise I want you to do is treat yourself to taking a little walk outside during the week. And um, to more closely notice your sense doors. How are they operating? Become more aware of how you are see, you see, smell, hear, taste, touch, and how thoughts just come up on their own. The way that we did this was we spent a whole day to see, just paying attention to how we were seeing, how it works. And then we spent a whole day trying to see how we hear. And then we spent a day on smelling and a day on tasting and a day on touching. And we were paying attention as you eat, don't eat your food fast. Don't do it. Number one, if you do, you're going to have trouble in your colon when you're older. Because why? Because it's a fact that your indigestion, your, your, your digestion juices, I'm sorry, your digestion juices begin in your mouth. So you're supposed to be chewing long enough for the water to start to be in your mouth. That means the first part 
of your digestive juices are in your mouth. Then it goes down and it has what it needs. It's going to be fine in your colon, but in your stomach and your colon. But if you have problems in your stomach, problems in your colon, don't eat fast and really watch yourself. If you've never watched yourself, get a mirror, you know, because I have seen some people just gobble down. Of course, you know, I'll tell you a secret. Monks and nuns have some problem with this because we're supposed to eat and um, finish what the abbot finishes. And the abbot's supposed to be very kind and watching everybody. <laughs> that doesn't always happen. Uh, it's so, you know, but if, that does, if it's done right, we finish when they finish. So don't get caught though. Really try to say something. If you're caught in a situation where you have 10 minutes to eat a whole meal and it's the only meal you get for the day, you need to go, peep, 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 I have something to say, peep, peep, peep. You have to beep up and say something. It's your body you're concerned with. It's very important. When you're practicing, um, become more aware of the, uh, while you're doing this, uh, while you're looking at these sense doors, keep your mind light, enjoy a fun observation time. Make this a game and smile as much as you can through uh, everything that you're doing during your daily life. Lightening up is extremely important with the meditation working. It's extremely important for your heart. It's ex important for your stomach. It's important for your lungs right now. I know this may be different for you. It may sound strange, but if you practice any other way before, but I just want you to please try to do this so that you can experience how different it feels when the tension begins to arise in a space where there was very little before. If you feel practice feeling light when craving starts to come up, you will feel it right here before it goes like that and pushes up. You don't have to wait till it comes up higher. And the sooner you can detect your craving, the faster you can use right effort to let it go. And this is what we're practicing in this practice. We are practicing right striving, right effort. So this is the end. Isn't that nice? This is the end of that. <laughs> this is the end. So I'm going to stop sharing and come back. And I want to ask for questions. Now we can put the chat up. I guess we can put it up and see if anybody types anything on it. <laughs> you know, and ask a Make question. question. Because Sister Deborah, what? there's one question. There's a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, a question. Right. Which Let of the see. six sense door uh -huh. is easiest to work with when we use the instructions as in MN 148, Chachaka Sutta? This is not me, this is not mine, this I am not. Is it different for each individual? Hence, we need to figure it ourselves, or we should really run through. No, all let, let's go back a minute. Let's go back a minute and talk about what 148 was, first of all. 148, when you look at the layout of this sutta, definitively, this sutta is a set of drills that were given to the monks in the meditation school by Sariputta and uh, Moggallana and the Buddha for the monks to practice. Now, you don't just practice on one of your sense doors. The structure of this is to practice by reading, always reading this with all six doors, six times. That's the whole point of the sutta is drilling your mind. For instance, when we're looking at, uh, and how did you come to this problem of thinking about everything so personally, uh, the monk said, he said to you, well, first of all, if anybody says the I is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the I is seen and understood, isn't it? The rise and the fall of your I is seen and understood. You see something? You see it happening and then it's gone. Is that true? Yes. Are you gone? No. 
So listen to what he says. If anyone says to, if anyone tries to tell you the eye is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the eye is seen and understood. And since its rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself rises and falls. But that is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say the eye is self, and thus the eye is not self. Now, if anybody says the form is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of this form that I see, the rise and fall of the form, uh, if anyone says the form is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of the form is seen and understood. It, it's here, I see it, now it's not there. Did I go away? Did I go away? You see the lesson here? And then he wants you to play with the ear. If anyone says that ear consciousness is self, that is not acceptable. The rise and fall of your consciousness is seen and understood. And since it's rise and fall are discerned, it would follow myself has to rise and fall. That is why it is not acceptable for anyone to say that the right, that the ear consciousness is self. Thus the ear is not self and the, and the sound is not self and the ear consciousness is not self, you see? So you do each one all the way through the six parts. This is a drill, a drill. When you ask me a question like that, it's almost like saying, can't we get the Nibbana in a box? I paid for the retreat. Can you give me the Nibbana in a box with a ribbon on it for 1995? <laughs> no, I can't. You have to trust me. The Buddha spent all this time and he's telling let me tell you what he said to Vacho. wait a second <laughs> yeah I, I really i really love vacha i i really i love vajikati because of this discussion and i mean it's so it's so clear it isn't funny he's getting really clear about this since 72 you go to 72 and you go to page uh okay <laughs> um, you see, Vach is trying to get picky and he's trying to tell, he comes to the Buddha to get help, but, but when Vach comes to the Buddha to get help, Vach is playing this game where he wants to tell him what he's done and how, see, how he's done it and what he's tried and what he thinks works instead of listening to the Buddha. So listen to what happens. When Master Gotama is asked, these four questions, he asks these questions above, he replies, the term reappears does not apply, Vacha. the term does not reappear does not apply. So they're having this big discussion about this. And then what does the Buddha say? He finally stops this discussion and he says, it is enough to cause you bewilderment, Vacha. enough to cause you confusion. For the Dhamma Vacha is profound, hard to see and hard to understand. It is peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning, subtle. That kind of means mere reasoning is like cheating and just using the eye. <laughs> you see, it's, it's, hard, it's, it's mere reasoning. It's subtle to be experienced by the wise. It's like you telling me you want to learn about a body, but you only want to study the arm. <laughs> or, you know, uh, like dermatologists, they cheat. They only want to go on the outside. <laughs> they don't want to learn the internal anatomy. All right. It is hard for you to understand it, when you hold, and listen carefully, it is hard for you to understand the Dhamma when you hold another view, accept another teaching, approve of another teaching, pursue a different training, and follow a different teacher. So I shall question you. And then he starts to question him and teach him. But the most important thing is that this is unattainable by mere reasoning alone. So my point is, if you practice with the eye in 148, you'll learn about the eye. Congratulations. Okay, but you won't know, you will not incorporate this learning about the ear and learning about the nose and learning about the tongue and learning about the body. It takes time which is what modern man doesn't want 
They want immediate gratification and a little tiny box, just like this little container here. This is it. Nibana. <laughs> you see? And we can't do that. We can't do that. So, but so you have to understand um, that this is what this is doing. And what's do the rest of the question, uh, Dama Gavesi, the rest of it. No, no, the rest is it? just about the, uh, he has to use one or all. That is nothing. There's nothing else in the question. Well, the answer is all. You should, yeah. <laughs> I should have let so you finish. Now the next I question is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next, Next question, question is, uh, flickering tiny <laughs> particles which arises and passes away rapidly. It's too fast. It pops up any time of the day, especially. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, wait, go back because I, di I, didn't, I didn't hear what we were talking about. What was the first word that is popping up? Uh, it says What's flickering popping? tiny particles. Uh-huh. Which arise and passes away rapidly. It's too fast. It pops up. That's right any time of the day, especially on the foot or near the mouth or thigh area with no craving. Please advise. Uh, Jayesh, uh, I think uh, he has to give a little bit more elaboration on the question. I, so I, this is flickering tiny particles means he is getting some uh, kind of sensations uh, near the kind of... Uh, is he talking? But is he talking... Is he, is he talking about during his meditation or are you talking about in life or what is this about? You didn't ah, tell me. You have to get a little bit clarification. Sister, ahead, can you Jody? hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so referring to the uh, you know, uh, small uh, atoms, what do we normally observe? Jayesh, Jayesh, I can't, I can't hear you. The connection's bad. If you want to try to write the question again, write the question again, sure. Sure. and I'll, I'll come, I'll answer it, okay? But I can't, the connection is bad with you, okay? Sure. Okay? Sure. Okay, write it down. Is there another question we can go to? Can he try once again? Jayesh, he's uh, going to try. He's going, he's going to try to write it down again. But are there other questions that can take another question and come back to it? No, no other questions. Oh no. my goodness! How many people are here? Twenty-three people and no questions. <laughs> I am magnificent. <laughs> okay, I, I just want to uh, confirm uh, that uh, there are four, pe uh, three people who have uh, confirmed to do the retreat. Uh, so I have sent those email addresses to your uh, email. That is rdv.kkretreats. Okay. And okay. Uh, the file which you had sent uh, of the retreat participants, I have added them. So I have added them in red. So you know they are new. Should I okay. send an uh, introduction email? Uh, yeah, I sent them a note uh, to go to that page to read about the retreat how it's structured okay and the if you send send them the letter that we sent before you have a copy of it yes. send them that it tells them what to put in the un introductory note so and have, i know i have sent you the email with the file you have maintained and the names the new names are there in uh, red okay the roster okay roster. okay i have sent you the, okay. the new names okay. are in red okay so okay. You know. Yeah. Okay. Did Jayesh write it again? The question. <clears throat> if hmm? one observes the arising and passing away of atoms in meditation or after yeah. meditation during the day, what about it? He kind of feels if? that he is uh, uh, seeing uh, certain uh, things near the mouth. And on the foot, it arises and passing away, uh, flickering uh, sensations. Is this happening during a meditation session or just while you're walking around in the daytime? In meditation or after meditation? 
in both the uh, cases. Okay. What does he? Which level is he working in? Does he know? Uh, uh, do you know which? Um, like, are you doing directions or are you doing meta? Meta. He is doing meta. Did he do the other people? No, I did don't. Did he do the? Okay. Um, does he want to yes, write he me? Does. He other did the people, other. Yes, have you done? No, 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 not Vipassana. Uh, have you done, uh, uh, after Metta, have we given you a, additional instructions like uh, other people or we say breaking down the barriers? Yeah, did he go to an online retreat? Did he? No, no, he has not done breaking down the barriers. He's doing Metta. Okay, so why don't you, um, do you want him to, can he write he to you? He's going for an online retreat it? currently. Huh? So, uh, I now think he's are, an online retreat? Yeah. Now so he's online, online? Yeah, yeah. In September. So why he, why he, in September he'll go. No, he needs to do something faster than that. Um, okay. Um, but he hasn't done a retreat yet, right? You have not done a retreat. Uh, no. He did the three days. He was a student at the University of Pali. So he did it three days. So I will tell you about uh, uh, my experience with the Vipassana. Uh, see, when you are getting this uh, kind of uh, sensations, uh, you have to basically in our meditation, you have to ignore those sensations. So uh, you keep your attention only on your object of meditation, which is metta. So if you are getting a kind of a uh, feeling of sensation, mm -hmm. don't give a kind of a name to it like it is a atoms or it is a flickering or anything like that. Because sensations are very much important in vipassana, but we, we give uh, in, uh, uh, importance to how our attention I'm is moving. So that uh, that is what yeah, uh, I, I think it is happening. Okay, I was remembering what we did in the three day and we mentioned quite a bit to them, you know, because we weren't going to be able to follow up. If he writes me privately, I'll take a look at where he's at and I can advise him, you know, or he can write to you. But we told them about okay. all the way into the fourth John and we explained it, okay? And they knew, they knew about, uh, about the um they knew about getting to the point where things were going to move up in the head and things like that so maybe he could write you and ask you if it's if the feeling where it is and if it's moved up you can give him the uh barriers okay, okay. to work with okay 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 does anybody else have a question Go, Ardika, what you got? There's another question. It's, um, well, it's about how to explain dependent origination to convince people with mental disorder that it is possible to get out of their suffering with twin. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a story, and um, this is what happened to me. Um, this is really when I was trying to learn origination very hard. I was driving from uh, the north in New York with Bonte down to Florida. And between New York and Florida on Route 95 in the United States, there's a very bad section for fires, you know? And there were very bad fires and they closed the road and we had to get off and go to a motel. And we were coming fairly, driving a little longer than usual, and, but it was still light. So we pulled off and uh, most of the motels were full already. And we went to where they told us there was a couple that had a small place and we got two rooms. And I said, it's going to be okay because there's uh, email. I can check by email. I was gonna do 
things with my students. And so he said, all right, stay here. It was just a regular little place, but it was very clean. And it was an Indian couple. So we pulled off <clears throat> and we got in our rooms and he was situated in his room. My room was at the other end near the office. And I uh, tried to get on the internet. It wouldn't work. I called him, he couldn't get on. And so um, he said, go up to the office and see if they can figure something out. I went to the office and he said, the guy who owned the place, he said, my wife is here. I'm going out for an hour or so. We close the office at this time because we're full. If you want to come in the house and use our, uh, you know, our computer, you can do that. So I went to the house, to, which was the end part of the hotel, and she was there. So I went in, and um, it didn't work there either. <laughs> but so she offered me a 7-Up, and, and she said, you know, uh, we're drinking 7-Up and just having a cookie. And, and she said to me very timidly, you know, I wanted to talk to you. And I said, what about? And she said, I wonder if you can help me. And I said, what about? She says, well, it's a very serious thing. I, I have a depression and, um, and I don't know what to do because my husband is getting ready to leave and, uh, and, and take the child and leave. And I don't want him to go, but I don't know what to do about this depression. It's, it's all my fault and I'm the one that's caused it. And I am, it's so heavy and I can't, I said, well, what happens? And she says, well, what happens is that he'll be sitting in the living room and watching TV with my son next to him. And I'll be sitting on the couch behind them <clears throat> and I'll be crocheting. And, um, and then all of a sudden I'm perfectly happy, but then all of a sudden it comes up in my mind and it overwhelms me. And as moment I feel this thing coming up, pressing and pulling me down, <clears throat> I have to very quickly put my crocheting away in the basket and get up and leave the room and go in my bedroom. And, what, and I said, why do you do that? And she said, because I have to go in there and light, turn the lights out and close the door and go to, go to bed. I can't be around anybody because I've ruined everything. This whole entire problem is mine and it's all completely me and everything is pressing down on me so hard. I don't want to even, they give me the medicine, but it doesn't, it just makes me try to not go for too deep. That's all, it just is so horrible. So I thought for a minute, and I wasn't teaching, but I was studying dependent origination very hard. Not, you know, if you know me, you know how precocious I am. <laughs> so I said to her, uh, what if I could tell, I could show you that this depression is not yours? And she said, that's ridiculous, it's mine. And I said, no. What, just tell me, what, what do you think you would feel like? Oh, it would be such a relief. I can't tell you, but that's not true. I mean, what are you talking about? And I said, do you have any paper? <clears throat> she got two pieces of white paper and we put them down on the coffee table. And when this happened was before I built the chart that you just saw, I was, it was coming. And so I was practicing and I built it step by step in front of her. If any of you have gone to listen to the dependent origination workshop online, you see how we did it. We made our own chart. There was no chart like this. So we together built it and colored it and talked about each piece through the 12 pieces. Then, we talked about what was personal and impersonal, how when you feel something's personal, it's yours and it's pressing on you and you own it and you become a victim. And she's just saying, yeah, you know, really identify. And I said, well, here's the thing. These red ones, if you understand them, maybe you can 
when you're beginning to feel that way, maybe you can just let go of it and relax and smile and keep doing the crocheting. And she said, show me the chart again. And I showed her this chart and I will never forget this. She looked across the table at me. She's looking at the chart and going very carefully through it in her mind. She was smart. She was a very intelligent person. And she looked across the table at me and she said, oh my gosh, this is not my depression. And I said, go on. It's not my depression. Now, we had not even talked about 148 or talked about anatta, anatta, nothing. This, we're just showing you how this works in your brain. No Pali is on that chart. Nothing Buddhist is on that chart at all. But she built that chart. So how did I get her to understand this all of a sudden? I give you a lesson in the workshop before I teach you to build this chart, don't I? And that lesson is, is a humanistic lesson. That lesson is about the life continuum line, like in the picture here, this life continuum line. And I teach you birth and death. I make you say it to me. I don't say it to you. I don't say, I want you to know this is birth. I, want, I say, this is where you're born. What's that? That's my birth. What's this? What's at the end? Well, that has to be death. Well, this little circle in the middle that's moving along this line, that's where you are. And that one is what? Well, it's probably, it's probably the present time now. It's now. That's right. That's right. And this line, what is that? Well, that's my life. Yeah, that's everybody's life and everybody's moving along that line. And then I said to her, I said, you know, um, every day you're alive, you get, uh, well, first we said, what is the past? I played the game with her. If I was a little girl, the daughter you never had, and she started laughing, you know, and I have my first spelling bee. Can you tell me, can you please tell me this is my first spelling paper? Can you tell me what the past means, mommy? And she said, she gave, started to talk to me. The past is over. The past is done. The past is locked in place in time. It's over. Anything that happened back then, can I reshape it? Can I recolor it? Can I mold it a different shape? Maybe. No, you can't, can you? You can't do that. What about the future? This is the other word I have, F-U-T-U-R-E. Tell me what the future means, mommy. Nobody knows what's happening in the future. Well, can't you tell me? You're my mommy. You should tell me what's happening. I can't tell you. Nobody can tell me. But I want you to tell. I can't tell you. It could be anything. Now, today we are unique. The more we tell the story, we have to say, because we're in a period of quantum physics, that it's not the future. It is the future that looks like this, right? All these choices, it could turn out to be looking like that instead of like that. Get it? So what you do now dictates what happens in the future. What you do this morning even dictates what you're like and feeling like the rest of the day. So the, the whole thing is about getting power back. The whole thing is about taking away, erasing the idea of victimology. Nothing is happening to you. What if that's true? Don't believe me, but if I say to you, what if nothing is happening to you? And everything you felt that was heavy and everything was happening from the way you were looking at the world. And she sat there and just looked at me and she said, this is real. I said, yes, it's real. Why didn't anyone tell me this? Why didn't they tell me this in school? I don't know. Why don't they tell us this in school, in high school? 
if we are in psychology or psychiatry, we should all be struggling and writing letters and putting up proclamations. Everybody deserves to know this life line continuum thing and that nothing is really happening to you. It's happening from how you decide to see it. You see? And she almost had tears in her eyes. She did have tears in her eyes. And I started crying. <laughs> I was the tears in my eyes. And I said, it's really neat, isn't it? She said, it's amazing. She kept the paper. She thanked me. Her husband came back. Next morning, he said, what did you say to her? Three months later, I get an email from her. She's not taking her medication anymore. There's no necessary for this. Because she can explain to the psychologist what's happening and it blew the person away you see if they're freudian they really want to fight with you they want you on the couch and they want you to listen period okay but this if you're thinking about the buddha was presenting something uh very very interesting okay when i teach you phenomenological approach to dependent origination i want you to know where this idea came from in psychology in 1940, before World War II, there was a man named Dr. Harvey, and he found something. He found a much higher rate of success with patients in anger management to handle them learning how one event happens at a time. And he called it a phenomenological approach in psychology for anger management. And then something happened. World War II. <laughs> and that went on for four years. And when we came out of World War II, Dr. Harvey wasn't around anymore. And what came out, though, of the, of the seed that he started looking at was behavior modification therapy. What I'm teaching you is behavioral modification of your behavior patterns. This is what the Buddha figured out. And this woman saw this right away. No one had ever, her husband was taking whatever was happening, it was happening to him. So he couldn't see it. She had no information about how her mind works. What I learned that day is that someone can be suffering tremendously, be on the brink of losing their family and everything that means anything to them, simply because in high school, they never told you anything about how your mind works. Not a word. The women learned menzies at about your time of month. The men learned what they learn in puberty. You learned about the skeletal structure and the basic anatomy. But honestly, in high school, and what happened was we don't talk about anything above here. You're not allowed to talk about anything above here. You have a broken arm, everybody will talk to you. If you have a broken leg, a broken hip, everybody will talk to you. But if you have something going on here, don't tell anybody anything's happening. This is the last taboo in humanity, right here, this. Because they don't think it's part, the average person doesn't even see that it's part of the body. And what did the Buddha say to Ananda when he said, Ananda said to the Buddha, Lord, where is the world? The simple question. Where is the world? My experience through this existence. Where is the world? It is between the top of your head and the soles of your feet. That's what he told him. He was very clear. And in my opinion, um, you know, Siddhartha Gautama is the father of cognitive psychology. No one else can claim this. He had it all down pat. I spoke another day, I spoke to a woman who had her master's degree in psychology and wanted to get a PhD in cognitive psychology, but she could not understand the life, human, uh, human cognition. So I was on the phone in Portland and she was in Seattle. We spent an hour I taught her this and she was like, I can't believe it. Now I get it. And these people who are, are studying this 
course they're all out of their minds too. The reason we're probably not going to hear about what they find out about, this is the truth, is because a lot of what they're studying is so they can build better robots and better androids in the future for space travel. We know this. This is true. I'm not making it up. A lot of the money for the research in mindfulness uh, comes from a group of colleges in all through the world called an Enron group. It's called Enron, 19 or 20 universities, specially studying and pooling together whatever they find for Android and robot brains. Now these people, they're really nice. <laughs> But you and I don't want to talk to them because they're going to ask us, what did you extirpate yesterday and things like that. <laughs> they're going to try to, when they write their papers, unfortunately for them, they get more points if they have big words. And sometimes when they send a paper back and say, I'm finished, the teacher says, no, no, not from this university. You have to have 14 or 20, 23 letter words. <laughs> they don't write for you and me. They don't talk to you like I'm talking to you. They're writing for themselves and that group of people and that speciality, which to me almost feels like that's not a good thing. <laughs> it just is almost like a crime. Why can't they tell us? They have taken human cognition at this point. The last time I checked, uh, I checked they had 27 links instead of 12. But even when they got to 12, <laughs> They didn't share it with us. And still you'll go to a psychologist or a psychotherapist and many times, oh, we don't talk about that stuff. It's too difficult for you to understand. But here's an Indian woman who didn't know anything. And she drew a picture and she found out something. This is not me. It is not mine. It is not myself. She started crying. Therefore, it is not my fault. I am not to blame. I just didn't understand. Give her three months. She's, she's crying. What can I say to you? What can I say? You see? But in the whole process of that, I want you to understand. I was not teaching uh, as a Buddhist monk at that point at, when this happened. I wasn't in robes. This was not a Buddhist issue. Uh, this was a mental suffering. And it's why I keep training is because of my mental suffering was wiped away. And because I struggle to make it easier and easier for you to see how you can use this in life. You see, that's what I really want to get across. He found something for humanity. And it's our job to share it. You start by sharing your smiles. That's it. Is there another question? Anywhere? <laughs> Any other question? Sister. Okay. Another yeah. question. So does that mean that during that three months, actually, she didn't do any forgiveness meditation or something like that? She just suddenly just understood that, well, those are not her problems or something like that? Or? She gave, what she did was she gave up her past. She embraced the present. Now you have to go into, the, she, they were Hindu and you have to go into the Hindu and they, they, they have the, the hell on earth. It's called the Kaluga. Isn't it called the Kaluga? Uh, that's what a, a friend of mine told me who was a Sikh. They say the Kaluga. And the one mother in the house where I stay, the one grandmother, she would come to the kitchen. I would say, how are you doing? And she goes, ah, oh, it's the Kaluga, Kaluga, Kaluga. <laughs> you know, and there was a problem at the at the, her son's business. And there was a problem in the house. And the water stopped downstairs. And the man cleaning the yard didn't show up. And it's Kaluga today. You know, we, it's like the Italian lady almost. She was She was really right there. You know, but I, I, I remember, you know, this. So they don't, they have a centering point. They try to stay where they are. But I think, I think what this is when I look at it, there are many faiths that have a lot of what we're teaching, a lot, okay? 
the Buddha just went one step further in than some people have this stuff that we're talking about right in their own religion. But he fine pointed it. It's what made him, instead of the holy man or or the guru to a certain level, it made him the Buddha. This is what it was because he had it so organized. Think about this for a minute. If you were teaching something and you taught the same subject for 45 years, can you imagine? Would you become an expert at it? If you were interested in that subject, whatever it was, um, do you think you would keep refining it and refining it to be in simpler, simpler ways to remember the pieces and how they're hooked together, right? The only thing that did damage to us was so many commentaries went out so many directions. It pulled this thing apart. And then when we start to tell you about the many pieces of it, okay, um, you shy away because you're thinking in terms of I have to know this piece completely before I can go to this piece, you see? And it's not like that. It's not like that all the time, is it? Yeah? So you, you, the thing, uh, one lady was really, really uh, excited when I was teaching in Mumbai. Afterwards, she came, she said, I can't, this is so brilliant, she said. I said, what's brilliant? What, what, what? She said, you make it come alive. I said, well, it wasn't supposed to be in a box in the attic stuffed in a trunk with blankets on top of it. You know, it was supposed to be a living, breathing teaching that we're using all the time. Yes, I'm excited about it, and you should be excited that it exists. And then when you do it, that how you come down, and, and one monk was really fun in, um, in Washington, D.C., where you go into Maryland, there was a coffee house, and I met with some women and Bonte and some other monks, and we're sitting there, and he said, he was, I was on fire, you know, with getting all the pieces into the puzzle. That was, I was like that. And he said, uh, the man, the monk said, what do you mean? We sat and I talked for an hour and I brought together all of the parts of the teaching from the five aggregates and the um, five precepts and the five hindrances and the um, three kinds of feeling and dove into the 37 requisites of enlightenment, all 37 of them, and taught the Eightfold Path in about an hour and a half. And he was shocked. He had never heard, he knew all the material, but he had never heard it in one place at one time hooked together. I try to tell you how many times I've told you if there's an artist, you, they need to spend some time with me. Maybe they can figure out what the pattern is on the loom that the Buddha made his cloth. What was the Dhamma cloth pattern? Some form of a, a, a beautiful tapestry with perfect symmetry and marvelous colors with the four noble truths on the corners and the 12 links of dependent origination. And in the characters, characters throughout the tapestry, you're going to find all the pieces. You're going to see the five aggregates that makes up the being. You're going to see uh, the precepts that protect you from the hindrances. You're going to see the three kinds of feelings and how suffering happens. And in each corner where the four noble truths are, there'll be a cluster, something that has to do with the 37 requisites of enlightenment, right? The four foundations of mindfulness, the four kinds of spiritual power, the four steps in right effort, the five faculties, the five powers, the seven enlightenment factors, the eightfold path. Sounds horrendous. Sounds like you want to drown in all these pieces, but they were spellbound and you weave them together. And now, even now, when I know this stuff this way, I'm just barely discovering that the five faculties have causal relationships and the seven factors of enlightenment have causal relationships 
similar to dependent origination. And if you lay them out, you start to see where they're causal. Try it, try it on a piece of paper. It never stops. It starts going deeper and deeper and coming out and you can see it so clear. So what did the tapestry look like? And somebody said, what are you gonna do with this? I said, well, you know, I wrote a story. <laughs> I wrote a story, but it doesn't have an ending. And they said, well, what's the story? I'll tell you very quickly. There once was an American who was desperate to get the answers to what we're looking at here. He packed his backpack and he came to Asia and started traveling all around. But he kept asking in each one of the traditions, he went to Himalayas, he went to Nepal, he went to Burma, he went to Thailand, he was here in India, and he kept asking, isn't there anybody who still remembers that they can talk about this where it's hooked together in some kind of a picture, something that's whole, that I can see, tangible thing. Finally, this old, old man on the side of the road, he stopped to give him some water and he said to him, go on over to that mountain and go halfway up, there's a village. If you go up there, you'll find what you're looking for. So he did, he went to the mountain and he climbed up the side of the mountain to the small village in the forest. In the plaza of the village, people were working and he started talking. They started asking him why he was there he said, I'm here just because I want the answer. They said, somebody is here that knows. Oh, she's still alive, they said. They said, go up, go up uh, there, up the side of the hill to that hut. She's dying, but she might still be able to tell you. He rushed up the side of the mountain, and he was going in to see and let him go in beside her to see if she could tell him anything. He had a translator and she smiled. She was very weak. She was lying on the table, looking out the window, just waiting to leave. But she smiled at him and she said, go into the forest to the barn. Go into the forest to the barn, he said. What for? That's where the answer is. He, she said. He went down to the plaza and they pointed to the forest and said, you go up that trail. You'll find it. It's just an old barn where the woman used to talk to a monk. He walked through the forest path until he came to the barn. When he saw the barn, he opened the door and part of the roof was gone. He looked above and he could see the sunlight coming in. It wasn't monsoon. It was past monsoon. He could see nothing but dust in there from opening the door too fast and the light coming down through the dust. And then he looked down at the floor and he saw a bunch of baskets. And in the baskets were these faded sticks with thread on them. And he didn't understand. In one basket, there were four red uh, sticks that looked like they fit on something and he couldn't quite understand what this was. These four sticks with red thread. Then he looked on the other basket and he saw three shades of blue. And then he saw uh, five different colors in another basket. And then he looked beyond and he saw 12 sticks inside one basket. And then he saw another basket with four and four and four and five and five and eight. He didn't get it at all. All these sticks, all this thread, what are they doing in this barn sitting here? And it, it looked like it used to be a barn for cattle or goats. He went back into the plaza. He said, I don't know what to do. He said, go up and ask her again. She's still alive. He went back up and he asked her, but I don't get it. What's the answer? And, and, and she said, go back to the barn and look in the corner and see what's there. He went back to the barn immediately. When he got to the barn, he went inside, went straight to the corner and lifted off a canvas that covered up an old loom. It was all still erect. It was all standing up. The pieces were still there. 
and so were most of the threads, but they were out of thread. And then he looked closer and he saw the colors on the loom were the colors in the baskets and that she had probably been putting together the Dhamma cloth. As he pulled the loom out, he saw there was still about three feet of cloth hanging there. And there it was, there it was. That was the pattern, that was the tapestry. Somewhere, somewhere, there is a Dhamma cloth still existing. That's what you're all trying to find. That's what we all have to find. That's what I've been trying to find for years is how did she put it together so that you could see the connections of it all. When you sit, you begin to see. When you begin to see, you begin to change. When you begin to change, you begin to act differently. When you begin to act differently, then open your eyes and in the world in front of you, there it is, the Dhamma cloth. And it's your turn to paint the pattern. That's it, folks. That's it for the night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, does anybody have any more questions? You can take one more question if you want. It's there. Question? Um, no? Hello. Okay. Somebody have a question? Uh, hi, sister. Um, I just have a question okay. um, mm -hmm. regarding the um, um, uh, the six arts. Um, for um, I've been practicing. Actually, I joined the online retreat um, a few months ago, and um, mm -hmm. I think the uh, the tensions in the bodies. I already recognize and letting it go more often, but now I start recognizing the tension and let go um, the tensions in the brain, basically in my head. And uh, I noticed right. uh, the more peaceful when I let start to let go of that. Um, I've been also um, uh, sending meta to the uh, my spiritual friend, but I just wonder if um, uh, if uh, when sh will we know that we can able to spread the meta to, you know, um, the four directions, the six directions or um, barriers, without barriers. Okay, to Tony, where, how far did you get when you were in your retreat? Um, did I you think practice I, um, with the other, did you practice the other kinds of people? I, I only able to get to, um, actually, I, I just stayed with my spiritual friend. Uh, at the end of the retreat. Just, okay, just so you were just with one spiritual friend. All right, let me ask you just a couple questions, okay? When you, are you still practicing? Are you still practicing some? Yes, yes, uh, one hour uh, in the morning every day. Good, that's very, very good. Okay, when you're practicing, are, are you smiling? Um, you need to keep yes. smiling. Okay, Kiss. okay. Now, is the feeling that you're... Okay, that's good. When you're sending the feeling to your friend, has have you felt um, anything change with the feeling wanting to move anywhere in your body? Like, have you felt that happen? Um, the feeling moving. You know, like when you're sending it from your heart and then you're sending it out to your spiritual friend and you're smiling, did you have the feeling, did you feel joy come up when you were practicing? Did you experience joy? Yes, but not uh, often compared to the retreat. Okay, but during the retreat, you experienced joy. At that time, now when you experience the uplift of the lightness and the joy, and I want to know if the feeling moves up towards your head, did you feel that happen? Is your loving kindness coming from your heart or is it coming from your head? Um, I think now it's like both. Um, um, let me just say, uh, okay. uh, make it clear okay, that uh, I know this. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this, this when I think of the word loving kindness, then I start to get intention. But if I just focus on the feeling itself, no word. Like if okay, I, like I just, don't want you to listen. I don't want you to focus on the feeling. I just want you to have the intention of sending the wish to your friend. But I think. 
what happened is when you just said sometimes my head and sometimes my heart, what happens is people have the experience of sending loving kindness from their heart and they are so overjoyed. They are able to send it from their heart. They don't want it to go up and stay in the head. But I want you to allow the feeling to go up into your head and uh, then uh, uh, send the loving kindness from your head to the person. Don't focus on the feeling. You just focus on the wish of, of your fe you're feeling happy and you wish for somebody else to feel happy. That's all this is. Don't complicate it. Okay. And don't try to create more feeling and don't try to judge how strong the feeling is. It can be very light and gentle or it can be very strong and pointed different in different people. Okay? okay. So when it moves to your head, what I want you to do then is come back on Saturday when I'm teaching, all right? It's a couple of days. I want you to practice now. When you come back on Saturday when I'm teaching, I want you, I want to know if this moves up into your head. I will give you instructions what to do, okay? Okay, thank you. Actually, um, thank you very much for the last vacation. Yeah. Okay? Yes. Okay. I will come back Any on uh, Saturday and uh, let yeah, you know. Saturday. Okay, good. Anybody else have a question? No more questions? Okay, we're ready to quit? <laughs> okay, let's say our prayer. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensations. Sadhu, sadhu.